stand up and join us. We're gonna we're gonna make some noise here this morning. We're gonna bring our praises and our songs, our prayers, our worship to the Lord this morning.
what you've done for me. he has done for us as we're getting close to the end of the year the end of the decade and uh, it, it is it's focusing or refreshing isn't it to think oh I get to I get to clear my mind I get to start into a new year I get to start into a new decade and uh, you can make sure that God is right with you right you you have that power you have the ability to whether you've been strong with the Lord or kind of off and on or in a difficult place, you can come back to him or you can, not that you ever went far from him, but you can say, God, I, I, I am with you and I want you with me, God. As we wrap up 2019, Lord, I want to be in your plan. I want to be in your will. I want to be used by you. It's so refreshing. And scripture reminds us that his mercies are new every morning and every day, every week we can sing a new song to him, right? What an amazing, amazing God. What a beautiful name our Savior has, the name of Jesus. His name is wonderful. His name is powerful. And his name is beautiful. Just make 
say that your name is powerful. We say that your name is good. It saves us, sustains us, and we give you thanks. Amen. Have a seat this morning. Good morning and welcome. My name is Steve Levine. I serve on the elder board here at Centerpoint, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here on the first day of the week. The last week of the year, the last week of the decade. (laughs) 
Hope you all had a, a very Merry Christmas um, and are looking forward to the start of a new year. Um, just wanted to remind you that if, uh, particularly if you're new here, welcome. Um, and uh, you'll find in the seat by, in front of you a, um, a contact card. And if you'd be so kind as to fill that out, let us know that you were here and uh, an idea of, of what brought you to Centerpoint. Um, and also, you'll notice on the back there's a place for responses. Um, that's for prayer requests and um, things that, that you would like the church to know about, things that you would like the church to pray for you about. Feel free to, to fill that in and place that in the offering plate as we take the offering here shortly. Um, find all kinds of good stuff on there, but um, just um, feel free to do that. We'd, we'd appreciate it. Also, um, I think everybody got a bulletin on their way in. You can check out this week's pretty light. Did you notice? I don't think youth, I don't think you got nothing this week. I think Tony's, Tony's out and about and gone, having a, enjoying some uh, well-deserved time off. Um, you'll, uh, the office is closed on, Wednesday, uh, on New Year's Day this week. But just a couple of things coming up. We, at the end of the, end of the January, we'll have our annual business meeting. Thank you. <laughs> and chili cook-off? I thought so. <laughs> um, so just remember that's coming up. Um, ministry leaders, you all got notified that, I, like I did this week, that we have uh, our annual reports. we got to get turned in to um, Sherry on time, so don't forget that. I'm um, trying to think if there's any other business I need to bring to your attention, and I can't think of anything, so I'll cut it short right there. Come on. <laughs> if we could have the gentleman come forward, and we'll receive our, our uh, morning offering. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a, a joy to be in your house this morning. Lord, thank you for an opportunity to just to, to praise you this morning, to give you the worship that to do your name. Lord, thank you for the, the songs that we're able to sing with the team this morning, and as they help us focus on you, as they help us focus um, our own hearts on giving to you the worship that's, that's to do your name. Lord, thank you that we have an opportunity to give back just a portion of what you've already given us, knowing that everything that we have comes from you. And it's, uh, it's an opportunity for us to gladly, joyfully, hilariously give to you um, so that we can, so that uh, our offerings can be used uh, to further the kingdom, both here at Centerpoint and, and our various ministries to, um, through reaching out to the rest of the world through our missionaries and through um, other organizations that, that we support as well. Um, but Lord, we also pray for there's uh, many that are out traveling this week. Thank you that Paul and Jamie are able to get away and, and and do some traveling. Lord, we pray that you'd protect them and keep them safe. Same with um, Tony and Tabitha as they get uh, some time away. And um, Lord, we just pray that you'd continue to bless them. We thank you for their lives and their ministry and for so much time and effort that went into preparing for the Christmas season. And um, and for Pastor Paul as he prepares to take us into this next year, Lord, we just thank you for their, for them. Um, but, Lord, there's also many others, uh, many of our friends and our, our church family who are traveling this week. Lord, keep them safe. Bring us back again safely. But Lord, thank you most of all that, that we can trust you, that we can count on you, that, that you sent your son to be our Savior. That if we believe in him, we can have everlasting life. And for that, we are eternally and forever grateful. Help us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, um, R.J. Kerper. I got a chance to meet him for the first time this morning, and uh, he's the Vice President of Curriculum and Training for Global Action and the Dean of Global Action's Global Church Foundation School. Graduated from Montana 
State University in Billings with a Bachelor of Science degree and received his Master of Divinity degree from Western Seminary. That goes back a ways. <laughs> in Portland, his, prof his professional career includes 29 years as an associate professor in Biblical Studies, Theology Department of, at Colorado Christian University. In addition, R.J. pastored for several years in his private counseling practice. He and his wife, Ermi, Ermi, live in Golden. He has two daughters and five grandchildren. R.J., welcome. It's a pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you for, share, for taking the pulpit. Dave, if I can get you to get me a bottle or a glass of water or something, that'd be awesome. I forget how dry it is here. Ermi, would you raise your hand? This is my wife. That's her right there. So she makes me look good. I'm really glad whenever she can come. You know, uh, good morning, everyone. Happy almost New Year. How are you guys doing today? You, you uh, holidayed out yet? Not yet? Some of you are still going strong? Excellent. You know, I, I was trying to think how far back I go with this church. It's a long ways. You know, I started the youth ministry department at what was then Western Bible College. And I'm pretty sure Paul, your lead pastor, was one of my students way back in the early 80s at Western. So I'm a fossil. And, um, and then through the years, Ryan Ward was one of my students uh, who uh, mentored uh, Brian, uh, Brandon Freda, who's the youth pastor at the church I attend out in uh, Northern Hills, if you know Brandon, Greg Steer, some of those folks. Uh, so anyway, I've got a long history uh, with, uh, with different um, youth guys here at, uh, at Center Point. So it's really a delight to be here and to share with you what God's laid on my heart uh, this morning. I'm not going to ask for hands, but... How many of you have ever made Chris, uh, New Year's resolutions? Okay, some of you brave souls did raise your hands. I actually did some research. I thought it would be good to kind of talk about that a little bit because we're straddling between last year and this year. And so we have those kinds of things on our minds as we think about uh, beginning the new year. So I did some research. Um, what do you think the top two New Year's resolutions are? Lose weight. Lose weight. Stay healthy, get fit and lose and stay healthy and lose weight. I also did some research on the resolutions that are most broken. You guessed it, same ones. In fact, I went further in uh, just my uh, investigation and four out of five people who make New Year's resolutions will eventually break them. In fact, a third won't even make it to the end of January. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, uh, time management, um, Franklin Covey found that uh, in polling more than 15,000, that nearly 40% of those surveyed attribute breaking their resolutions to guess what? Having too many other things to do. That makes sense, doesn't it? We just kind of fall back into that lifestyle, that routine. Um, and 33% say they simply aren't committed to the resolutions they set. And yet, you know, because of the time of the year, most of us are kind of thinking about the past year and reflecting a little bit and kind of looking ahead to this new year. So it is natural to be thinking about how we want to do things differently this next year, or how we might want to do things in a new way this year. So you guys can relax because I'm not going to give you more things to do. You already have enough of that. But what I want to talk about this morning is perhaps a paradigm shift not only to talk about how we might do things differently, but maybe even more importantly, why. I want to pray, and I want to really ask, I want to ask the Holy Spirit just to really be with us during this time. Father, I thank you for this time that we can share together um, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we spend a few moments in your word and reflect again on the Christmas story, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would have the freedom to do in us what you want, dear spirit, move in our hearts, move in our minds, move in our wills. And as we straddle this new year, I pray that um, in all things we might put you first. That ours would not be a, another try hard year, but ours would be a trust and obey year. So we look to you now just to speak to us individually and speak to us powerfully in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 
This morning, I want to begin with a statement that uh, Jesus made, a very familiar one, I'm, I'm guessing. In John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. You know, of these, design these three designations, we probably talk about the way the least. And yet, the way is so important. I want to spend some time talking about that this morning. And how I want to do that is I want to return to the Christmas story just one more time. I think sometimes, you know, the passages that we read and the things we do around the Christmas story have kind of become iconic and we've, we're kind of used to them. So I, I want to go back to the Christmas story just one more time and reflect on it from the perspective of the way that Jesus is talking about. And I want to talk about it by contrasting two very distinct and different ways that the author Matthew illustrates very powerfully in the first couple chapters of the book of Matthew. One was the way of Herod. The other was the way of Jesus. And as we look at that, I want to pause and just kind of take a step back for a second because there's an important thing I, I need us to, to recognize as we go into the Christmas story in the book of Matthew. You know, there's always two stories going on at any one time. You know, there's the stuff that's happening down here. We're going to see that here in a minute in the, in the first couple chapters, uh, actually specifically chapter 2 of the book of Matthew. And Matthew does a good job of kind of talking about the story of what's going on in Judea and, you know, the wise men are coming and there's King Herod on his throne and there's lots of stuff that's happening down here. But what Matthew is really good at doing is talking about, that's the second story, but he's also very good at talking about the first story. There's another story going on up here. And, and what Matthew does a brilliant job of doing is he goes back to the Old Testament and at least 30, uh, 23 times uh, cites Old Testament scriptures that talk about what's going on, that predicted what's going on here. So there's always two stories that go on at any given time. There's the second story and there's the first story. And I talk about that as we go into this particular a portion of scripture is that the same is true in our lives. You know, we all had stuff. I have met a couple of you, but I wish we had more time. I'd love to hear, how, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story and about what's gone on in your life this past year. You know, I think sometimes one of the challenges is that we get stuck down here. And we we're focusing on the, on the challenges, we're focusing on the things that, maybe the disappointments, maybe for some of us the losses that we experienced this year. And it's, it's easy to kind of lose focus and lose our perspective because we get stuck down here in our stories. And that's part of the reason, I think, sometimes why we, we don't finish our, our we don't complete our resolutions that we made is we kind of get locked into that what I call the try hard cycle. Uh, I'm just, I'm gonna do things differently this year and I'm, I'm gonna have more, I'm gonna spend more time in the word and I'm gonna spend more time in prayer and uh, all very good things, but all very important things. But when I get lost here, when I lose my perspective that there's something else going on up here, when I forget that or when I don't realize that, that's when I can get into trouble. So I want to talk about this, how we can maintain our focus this next year, regardless of what God is calling you to do, what are some of the ways that we can maintain the focus by following the Jesus way? And to do that, I want to spend our time in Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to look at that Christmas story, and I want to talk about it from a couple of perspectives. One is this perspective, and another is this perspective. And we'll begin by the first verse in Matthew chapter 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. Bethlehem was, as you know, a small village just southwest of Jerusalem, a few miles. When we read the Christmas story, there's different perspectives, I guess, as to how that came about or where that came about. Some feel he was born in a manger. I personally believe from the research that Jesus was probably born in the room. There were most houses, the typical 
house during this time period had two rooms. One was the room where they kept the cattle and the animals, and that was a means by which they could help keep the house warm. Everybody else, the others, slept in another room, stayed in another room, and because of the census, you know, the, the, the room, however many there, rooms there were, they were full. So Joseph and Mary uh, and, and the, the about-to-be-born Jesus are kind of stuck down in that smelly, unsanitary room, and it all happened during the reign of King Herod. And while Jesus was being born amongst the animals, Herod was reclining in his palace. Eugene, author Eugene Peterson uh, notes that he was the richest man in the world. If you've ever read anything about King Herod, he wasn't a good guy. He came into power in 37 BC and ruled Judea for 34 years. He was a brilliant politician who knew how to navigate between the powers in Rome and the locals in Judea. And he did a couple of things. He, he placated the Jews by, uh, in two ways. One is that he married one of the Hasmonean daughters, Miriamne. But the mo second and the most important one is that he rebuilt the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. And it was a magnificent structure. And that was the structure that um, often Jesus encountered the Pharisees when you read the Gospels. In spite of this, he was a hated man because of the burden, the tax burden that he put on the people. And as he got older, his paranoia, his personal narcissism got worse and worse to the point where he would just randomly execute people, eventually including two of his sons and his wife, Miriamne. And uh, as our story continues in the book, uh, he was despised by the Jews, and the s rumor began to circulate that the prophecies were, gonna, uh, were about to be fulfilled, that a, a baby was about to be born who would be the long-awaited king. And as those rumors circulated, you can imagine how narcissistic Herod began to react and it became full-blown when the wise men showed up to worship him. And the text talks about that. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. You know, as the story goes, and again, we're still talking about this kind of stuff down here, he wanted to find out where this Christ is. In Bethlehem, the religious leaders tell him, as was prophesied in Micah 5.2, and he was to rule, the prophecy tells them, in the land of Judah. So as our story goes on in chapter 2, verse 4, he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, for this was the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a, ru a, ru a ruler excuse me, will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Now, as the story goes here, and I think sometimes we forget this, is because in our, our typical Christmas scenes, you know, the wise men are included in that, in that manger scene, but that, that's really not true. When you look at the language here, by the time the wise men come to Jesus, uh, and it could have been anywhere from several weeks to over a year old now, Jesus is, uh, and they're now living in their own house, or at least a house, and we continue the narrative in the next several verses. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, 
For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night Joseph left for Egypt with his child and mother and Mary his mother and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was born in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. As was spoken to them in a dream, they head for Egypt, and I can just imagine what that journey must have been like. For our moms here, can you imagine having a young baby and having to travel in this kind of desert terrain? So they head to Egypt, and I think the point that Matthew was making in making certain that he was clear about that point is that Jesus was going to be the new Moses. He was going to be the new deliverer. And that's one of the kind of the backstories in how the book of Matthew was written. Just as Moses delivered his people out of Egypt, so Jesus is now going to deliver his people once and for all, for all time. Obviously, Herod is angry. In fact, he goes on a rampage and he kills all the boys in and around Jerusalem thinking that the boy is still there. But as we know, God's purposes are not thwarted regardless of how powerful an earthly king could be. God's still sovereign and he's still working out his story, not only in Jesus' lives, but in Jesus' life, but in our lives as well. If you go back to that reference in, um, in Jeremiah 31 that's quoted by Matthew, it's actually Jeremiah 31, 15. Cont- keep reading in that, in that text because it goes on to talk about the fact that there's hope. And the hope is going to come in the form of a Savior. And Jesus, and that's, that's the context in which the new covenant was articulated by Jeremiah. Yeah, as awful as that was, and I can't even imagine the horror and the despair that people must have felt. God, despite that, was still doing good things and accomplishing his purpose. And I think sometimes we forget that in our lives. You know, life can get pretty grim sometimes. And I was out for a run, and there's a, fa- uh, there's a, a, a couple, actually, uh, that, that goes, that is, their, their home is right along my running path. And uh, they, they've had a tough life. She experienced a stroke almost 30 years ago and, um, and has been dealing with that uh, disability ever since. And uh, the day I, I ran by, she kind of flagged me down and, and she let me know that her husband had just been diagnosed with, with pancreatic cancer. And if you know anything about that disease, it, um, it's, it's a difficult one to overcome. And and I could tell just sitting there on, on her porch and, and listening to her, her talk about this is that she, she, she didn't know what she was going to do now because he's been her caregiver for all these years. And so that's, that's the challenge that they're going through right now. As we return to our story, we'll keep reading in the book of Matthew. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be called a Nazarene. So when Herod died, probably several months after Christ was born and his family had fled to Egypt, he was about 70 years old when he died. And just a little backstory there about his death and just to show you what kind of a, a guy he was. 
as he was thinking about his impending death, he, he sentenced a number of, um, he, did, he did a couple things. One is he built his own mountain as a place for his uh, burial. So I think, yep, there it is. Um, and he wanted everybody to mourn his death despite the fact that he was hated by everyone. So he rounded up a bunch of the royal Jewish families, herded them into the Hippodrome, and was prepared to, to, um, to kill them all, to execute them all, so that everybody would be mourning. And in Herod's mind, he's thinking they're going to be mourning for him. That's how sick this guy was. But thankfully, that never happened. And in the meantime, God in his sovereign plan was leading this young family not to stay in Judea under the reign of Archelaus, who was uh, much like his father, Herod the Great, but to go north to Galilee where he would grow up. During, that, during those years, uh, he and his father were, were carpenters. If you've ever seen anything, um, if you've ever seen pictures or have been to Nazareth, you know that it wasn't much of a town. You know, there weren't that many people. And so here's Jesus, and he's growing up in obscurity, and he spends most of his life pounding nails or working with, uh, with, with stone, possibly in the, in the town of Sephoris, which has been recently uncovered, a major city. You know, you think about that for a second, just from a strategic point of view. It doesn't seem to make much sense in our, our modern era that Jesus would grow up in a little town like this. Now, sh shouldn't you be headquartered in Jerusalem or at least Caesarea on the coast, another major city, and uh, with access to, to getting the message out? But as we know in scriptures, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And God is accomplishing his sovereign purposes through Jesus. And all those years he spent in Nazareth, he was learning obedience he was learning just to be ordinary. He was learning to, to trust his heavenly father. And all of that was, would become and was part of the Jesus way. As I contrast these two ways, I think we can, if I could summarize it, there is the Herod way, and I'm sad to say that's probably also the American way. Within that perspective, we start with this Reality is all about me. Because of that, I am driven to meet my needs and my wants, and my response then is to try and manage my life in a way that makes certain that it is about me and that I get what I want or I get what I think I should have. And so as a result of that, we tend to use Jesus. In other words, Jesus is there for me. And I'm going to manage my life my way, and I want Jesus to kind of be part of that to help me live my life better. Um, I'll tell you where we, as, as Steve shared in the introduction, I work for uh, a ministry, a, mission, a missionary organization called uh, Global Action. We train pastors in really hard places all around the world. And one of the things we really have to fight against is the prosperity gospel in so many of these, uh, in so many of these countries. And, um, and the challenge of it is that uh, these pastors will, will, will promise the people that, that God wants you to be successful. And so if you give your money to me in the church, then God's going to make you rich. But the problem we're finding is that the pastors are getting richer and the people are getting poorer because of this false gospel. And so we're pushing against that. Does God want to bless us? Absolutely. But because he wants to, not because we're earning his favor and, he, and because he wants us to be rich. And so these pastors use Jesus as a way to fleece the flock, if you will, and to get their way. But that's not the Jesus way. In the Jesus way, it's never about me. It's not me doing what I want. It's me being led to follow him. And when that happens, then I serve him rather than I use him. You see, this is a whole different paradigm shift than what often we think about. 
And I think our passage gives us some clues as to how we do this. And I start with the wise men. We, we begin with worship. Uh, thank you, worship team, for, for leading us well this morning because that's where we always need to start. That's what the wise men showed us in the book of Matthew. They're overjoyed and they bow down to worship this newborn king and they present him all these amazing gifts because they got it. You know, these, they were probably, a, a, you know, steeped in the, in Zor, in the Zoroastrian religion of, of Persia. So they were mostly as astrologers, and yet they recognized, at least at some level, that this is the king that's worth worshiping. And that's what worship is. It's worth-ship. And I start with this. We need to start with this because without that perspective, without that rec recognition that God is God and I am not, it's going to be really hard for me to go to the next step. But when we do get to that place, when we can stop and recognize God for who he is, recognize that there's another story going on that's not about me, that God wants to do something in us, and then he wants to do something through us this next year as we serve him. We begin with worship. We, been, we begin with spending some time recognizing God for who he is. And then we trust. I want to talk just for a moment about that because that's a little bit different than faith, although they're very much connected. I think most of us would say we have faith in Jesus, but trust stay, takes it a step further because when we trust, we take God at his word. And that's what... That's what Joseph and Mary did. They had a dream. I can't imagine, you know, I, I have dreams like this too, but I can't imagine packing the whole crew up and heading down to Egypt because I had a dream. And yet at some level, Joseph and Mary recognized that this was God talking to them, and because of that, they were willing to trust that God would provide for them as they wandered south through the desert, through the Negev on their way to Egypt. Brennan Manning in his book, Ruthless Trust, talks about that, tr tr talks about trust. He says, trust is the gift that we give back to God. Trusting is simply taking God at his word. Joseph trusted when they went to Egypt. Joseph trusted when the angel told him to head back north and to spend his, to, 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 to move to Galilee. And I think for some of us this next year, I think God is going to be calling us to a new level of trust. And often that shows up in two different areas. One of them is God leading us in a way that's been different than the way that we've done things before. I think sometimes that's where, that's where faith can get us into trouble because we get so used to doing things by routine. And, and so, and, the, and that, that makes sense because it's the comfortable, it's the, it's, the, it's the safe, and it's predictable. And yet God might be saying to us, in, in the past you've done things this way, but I don't want you to do things this way. I want you to trust me because I'm going to take you in a new direction. Now, it may not be a dream, but he may be using somebody else, but he's saying to you, you going to trust me? And as I look at your faces, I, I know that God is speaking to some of you right now. He's nudging you saying, yeah, let's do, some, let's do things different. For some of you, it's going to be something brand new. You know, because that's what faith is. It's moving from, but it's also moving to. And there's the second part to that. We obey. All right, Lord, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. One of the th reasons I love working for global action and spending time with our different Christians around the world in developing country is they get it when it comes to faith. Many of them do. I just came back from Poland, and, po and uh, Polish Christians are a really, really small minority. And yet, just as I was in the room with all these youth workers from all over Poland, man, the, it was palpable to, to, to just feel their excitement for, for going back to wherever and serving Jesus in a country that's very very religious, but not in the right way. It's taking a risk, doing what God has called us to do. We worship, 
We trust and then we obey. It's really pretty easy, but it's also pretty hard because often what, what happens to me is I get stuck in this story. I'm trying to figure it out. And God's saying, no, no. Uh, I'm doing something else, and, and I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. Like Peter in Matthew 14, I want you to get out of the boat while the, the other 11 stayed in the boat, and Peter was the only one that was willing to take the risk to both trust and obey. And we sometimes criticizing, but I don't think he was the one that we should have criticized. It was the other 11 that stayed in the boat safe at the bottom. And God's saying to some of us this morning, are you ready to get out of the boat? John Cavanaugh, who's a British ethicist and philosopher, went to, to serve with Mother Teresa for three months in Calcutta, he went there seeing, hoping, seeking a clear answer as to how best he should spend the rest of his life. Uh, the very first morning, he met Mother Teresa, and she asked, what can I do for you? What do you want me to pray for? And Kavanaugh was quick to respond, pray that God will give me clarity about what I should do. And in her Mother Teresa way, she snapped back at him, no, I'm not going to do that. When you ask her why, she said, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and you must let it go. And Kavanaugh commented that she always seemed to have the clarity he longed for and she laughed when he said that to her and said, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I'm going to pray that you will increase in your trust for the Lord this year. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing in our lives right now. And as we straddle not only between a new year, but between a new, de in, between a new between decades, I just pray that um, you will help us. Help us to begin with you. Jesus, you taught your disciples to pray in Luke 11. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That before we get to the give us our, this day our daily bread, you told us that we need to stop and recognize that God's name is holy and hallowed. And that, Father, you are sovereign. And you've got a plan. And we get to... Look into, as we begin this new year, we get to, to stop and pause and we have to ask ourselves, what story are we living in? I pray that um, we would live in yours, even when things aren't going well down in our little worlds, that we would recognize that this is all part of the plan and that we can rest in your word and in your promises and we can trust you to do in us and then trust you to do what you want through us not for our glory, but for yours, as part of the Jesus way, who's, in whose name I pray, amen. RJ, thank you so much for coming to share with us. We really appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and let you folks go. We'll play you out with some music, but uh, you are dismissed. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Can we just give RJ a hand as well? Thank you so much, RJ. Really appreciate that. If you have questions, or you, he'll hang out up front if you have some questions or would like to chat with him. Thank you and have a great, great week.